I invite you to take a seat and grab your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the book of Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5 is our text today as we're continuing our study in the book of Romans. Uh, if you don't have a Bible with you, that's fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. Turn to page 1119 and you will be able to join us in Romans chapter 5. That's the text for today. And as always, if you don't have a Bible and you want one, you need one, you feel like, hey, I want to read God's Word, then please take one of those with you. Uh, this is our gift to you. We want you to have the Word of God and read the Word of God because we know if you do that, then God will change your life. Hey, there's a lot of stuff going on. You've heard about it. I just want to point this out. Uh, if you feel like you need to confess your faith in baptism, we got baptisms planned at the lake uh, June the 3rd. If you feel like God wants you to serve, we've got service opportunities up at Peach Springs uh, just uh, in a few days. If you feel like, uh, hey, I uh, want to learn more, we've got Bible study options coming up. Uh, you know, our life groups are kind of uh, taking a break for the summer, at least for part of the summer, and we've got a Bible study that's going to be happening Thursday nights, 6.30, right here in our student wing uh, on the book of Ephesians. God has blessed us with uh, retired pastors who come in here, and they're retired, but they're not like out to pastor yet. So um, they want to serve, and Greg Pellet is one of those, and he's going to be doing a Bible study in Ephesians. So if you're in a place where you just want to learn some more, you go, hey, I, I want to do Bible study, uh, then Thursday nights, uh, it's going to happen here. You can sign up for it right after the service outside. There's a table, so stop by there and say, hey, uh, put me down on the list, and uh, I'm, I'm excited about that. It starts on the 31st of this month. Hey, uh, do you guys love your kids? Okay, see, it's no brainer. Of course we love our kids. And we love watching our children grow. I mean, think about it. You start off and they're this helpless, cute little lump that you just hold all the time, right? And, and, and you're like, oh, I love them. And, and then they, they start growing on you and they start sitting up and, and, and then they start crawling. And everybody's all excited about them. My kid's crawling before your kid, you know, kind of thing. And it's not a competition, really, but we're excited. They're crawling, and then they're walking. They're eating real food. And then they get to that real celebration point of their early development, potty training, right? Every parent rejoices because that your, your, your budget just expands then. And then you got, you know, preschool and elementary school and junior high and high school. Along the way, there's driving, dating, graduation, and then there's college or trades or military and jobs and they move out. Praise God, right? And, and they have their own families. And then you get the ultimate blessing. Grandchildren. Yeah, I see those of you who have them. I know that. And, and then, but here's the thing. Grandchildren, the process starts all over again. And you get to watch them grow up. We love watching our kids mature and grow up. And, uh, and yet it's a tragedy when they don't. It's a tragedy when, when they don't grow up physically, that, you know, there's some kind of a disease that prevents them from growing, and we grieve that, or, or when they don't develop mentally, and they're developmentally disabled, and, and we grieve that, or, or we're just when they grow up, and they never learn responsibility. We grieve unnatural immaturity, and God grieves it with his children as well. Uh, you see, the Bible says that the moment that we became followers of Jesus Christ, when we believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, and we believe that he died on the cross to pay for our sins and was raised from the dead, and we make that commitment to follow Jesus with our lives, in that moment we become children of God. Scripture says, to as many as received Jesus, even to those who believed on his name, he gave the right to become children of God. And so we're children of God, and God delights in us, but he wants to see us make progress. He wants us to grow up and to evidence maturity. So today we're looking at Romans chapter 5, just the first five verses in this text. And, and as I read these, uh, I just want to challenge you to, to listen to the discussion about growing up. So the Apostle Paul, writing to the church in Rome, says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance 
And endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. A very brief passage with some incredible challenges. And and as we examine this passage more closely, I want to challenge you to do kind of a maturity check on yourself. This is not for the person sitting next to you, so keep your elbows to yourself. Uh, This is for you and the Holy Spirit to kind of look in the mirror of Scripture and go, hey, am I making progress or am I spiritually stuck? So if we're going to grow up, uh, first of all, we need to realize that we have peace with God. Realize that you have peace with God. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So if you have faith in Jesus Christ, if you are a follower of Jesus, we've already talked about what that looks like, then that means that you have peace with God because of what Jesus did. Uh, See, we were enemies of God. We were living on our own. We were living in defiance of God. Uh, So we were uh, just doing things our own way. We were at, at war with God, in a sense, because he said do this and we said no. And then when we confessed Jesus as Lord, we submitted to his authority. And so we stopped resisting God, and we said, okay, now I have peace with God, and I'm his, and so now we're his children And as his children, that means we know that we are loved by God. And not only are we loved by God, but we're accepted by God. And God is for us. God is for you. Now, now some of you may be sitting here thinking, yeah, I don't know that God's really for me. You hear the words, you agree with the words, but you don't feel it in your soul that God is really for you. So let me illustrate this, because God is your heavenly Father. So how many parents are in the room? If you're a parent, let's see your hands. Okay. Parents in the room, how many of you parents want your children to succeed? Yeah, see, every parent raises their hand because there's not a parent in the world that you meet and go, yeah, I really want my child to be a loser. I want him to be a dismal failure. I want him to be an embarrassment to me and a drain on society. Um, no, we're, we're, we want our children to succeed. So you are for your children. Now, you are for your children as parents even when they don't agree with you. Think about that. You know, there's a lot of times parents are like, hey, here's kind of what I see is the best path for you because we, we kind of, I'm not talking about the controlling, you know, freak out sense. I'm talking about just, hey, I've made those mistakes and here's some counsel, here's some wisdom to pass on to you. And we do that and we're, we're broken. We're sinners. We're unrighteous. God is our father in heaven. He's perfect. He loves us. He's for us and he wants us to succeed. So if you've committed your life to following Jesus, you actually have peace with God. So stop struggling against him. Stop resisting his will, his wisdom, his path for your life because he is for you and he wants to bless you. But we have to grow up enough to realize that God is always for us. And his path is better than our path. And his wisdom is better than our wisdom. And his way is better than ours. And, and uh, a lot of times we're like this child I, I was traveling with uh, not too long ago. I was flying back from Nashville uh, to Vegas. And uh, this two-year-old was with his dad and his grandma on the airplane. And he was like a typical two-year-old. And I was sitting right behind so I could see this. And, you know, and he was playing. And he was, you know, they were just feeding him. Because that's what you do with children on airplanes, right? Here's food, here's toys, here's food, here's toys. Which one do you want? Just, just don't scream, right? And, uh, and so this child, he's pretty happy until they make the announcement that, hey, we're starting our descent into Las Vegas, and that means that everybody has to do what? Sit down, buckle up, right? Put on your seatbelts for safety's sake. And, and so dad starts trying to put his child in the seat and buckle him up. Only child does not want to be buckled up. Child does not want to get in the seat. Child throws a royal fit, Right? The kind that every parent prays that their child will never throw in public. No, he throws that. And he is arching. And, he's, and I'm sitting right behind him. So I'm watching this thinking, thank you, God, that my kids didn't do that. Uh, and uh, <laughs> no, at least not in public. And uh, so they, you know, and, and dad is wrestling with his child. And I'm thinking, that's exactly what we do. Here the dad is trying to do what is best for his child. He's trying to protect his child. He's trying to preserve his health and safety. And his son is resisting.
You see, part of maturity is realizing that God is for you. He really is for you. He's for the, the, your blessings. He's for your health. He's for your life. He's for your marriage. He's for your family. And so you, you embrace his plan. You embrace his will. You embrace his wisdom. So right now, are you uh, resisting God or are you at peace with God? Because it's an indication of maturity which one you're leaning into. So growing up means that we realize we have peace with God and it means that we stand in grace. Stand in grace. Verse 2, through Jesus we have also obtained access by faith, by believing in Jesus, into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Uh, Paul says, look, you're standing in grace, and it's this grace, this, this gift of God that comes through Jesus' sacrifice that qualifies us for heaven, that, that promises us heaven. And we want to stand in that grace because all of us are standing on something. All of us have something that is our identity, it's our purpose, it's kind of how we, we measure our life by because we're all trying to become something or build something or accomplish something. And Paul says, stand in grace. Some of us are standing on our business. We're trying to be successful. We're trying to build a business. We want to run it. We want people to, to recognize it. We want to make money. We want to do all that kind of stuff. We're, we're, our identity is wrapped up in our business. And some of us, our identity is, is wrapped up in family. We're trying to stand on our family, trying to have the perfect family, build memories, go all the fun places, go out on the boat, play, you know, because we're trying to do that until the day they get up, you know, and, and leave and go, go away. Some of us are trying to, you know, build our identity on our reputation. We're standing on our reputation. What do other people think of you? You know, we even have a phrase for it. What's your standing in the community? It's reputation. How do people see you? For, for some, that's what you're standing on. Some of you are standing on your good works. You're trying to be a good person. You're trying to bless others. You're trying to be good enough so that when that day of judgment comes, you're going to, I'm going to make it to heaven because I'm good. The Apostle Paul says, look, subjugate all of those other things to standing in grace. And, he, and he's saying this out of his own experience because he had the reputation, he had the success, he had the accolades of people, and he said in Philippians 3, I consider all of that dung, refuse, garbage, for the sake of knowing Christ and him alone. He says it's all worthless except for Jesus. He goes, stand in grace. Stand in grace. This is what it means to stand in grace. Because, you know, in churches, we talk about grace a lot. We sing about it, but living it is a lot harder. Standing in grace means that we admit that we're a mess, that we're hopeless, that we're lost without Jesus. And the only reason we can do anything or be anything at all is because of the grace of God that we have received through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Standing in grace means that we stop trying to impress God. And by the way, we stop trying to impress other people by our good works, our good deeds, our piety, our, our, you know, goodness. We realize that we are loved completely by God and nothing is going to change that. Standing in grace means that our hope of heaven is only because of Jesus' death and resurrection. You're not going to get there because you're a good person. We're going to heaven because we trust Jesus. We place our faith in Jesus and he's going to take us there. Standing in grace means that we admit that we're a mess and we stop judging other people for being a mess. And we give them the grace that we have received and we're people of forgiveness. So this morning, what are you standing in? If it isn't grace, it's just a pile of dung. See, growing up means that we stand in grace we realize we have peace with God, and it means we rejoice in our sufferings. Look at verse 3. Not only that, standing in grace and knowing that we have peace with God, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. We rejoice in our sufferings. Now think about this. This is absolutely insane that Paul says that. 
I don't know if you're like me, you read the Bible and you're reading stuff and you go, okay, I should do that. Okay, that's good news. And then you read something like this and you go, does God really mean this? This is crazy. He wants us to rejoice in our sufferings because that is not the natural response we have to pain and suffering and tragedy, is it? That's not our natural response when we've been betrayed or robbed or hurt or attacked. It's not what we do when we lose a loved one or when we uh, get the terrible medical report or we're involved in some kind of tragic accident. Right? What is our natural response in those moments? Well, we, we complain, right? Why me? It isn't fair. Why did this have to happen to me? Or we blame. This is your fault. If you hadn't done this, if, I, if they hadn't done this, it's these people's fault. They ran the stop sign. You know, the, they, they acted this way. They did this. We blame other people. We get angry. We get angry at others. You know, the people that we consider at fault, we blame them. We get angry at ourselves. If I had known, I wouldn't have done this. If I wish I'd done this differently. I wish I'd done that. We get angry at God. God, if you loved me, you wouldn't have let this happen. God, you could have stopped this. Why didn't you stop this? We whine. I'm the only one that this happens to. It always happens to me. You see, God wants us to respond differently to adversity. He wants us to choose a mature response. God actually challenges us to rejoice in, not because of our sufferings, but in our sufferings. He doesn't want us to rejoice because the bad things are happening. He wants us to rejoice while the bad things are happening. Why? Because this is part of growing up. This is part of God's growth process. And he tells us exactly what it looks like in Romans 5. He says, first of all, understand that your suffering produces endurance. Endurance just means refusing to quit. Not giving up. And, and let's just be honest, endurance is not really glamorous, is it? Somebody says, hey, you know, what, what do you want God to teach you next? Nobody ever says endurance. <laughs> no, no, teach me to love, you know, I want to be loving, teach me, you know, but no, endurance. And yet God has to teach us endurance. It is foundational to the development of the Christian life. In other words, as we face adversity, as we face the pain and sorrow, the suffering, we just, we can't give up. Because if we refuse to quit, then endurance produces character, the character of Jesus. See, when you signed up for this Christianity, when you said yes to Jesus, when you bowed your knee before him, uh, what you're saying is, I want the Holy Spirit of God who's in me to teach me to be like Jesus. I'm a follower of Jesus, a disciple of Jesus, and disciples learn from their teacher, their master, how to be like him. And so we've signed up to say, hey, we want to be like Jesus. And, and here at Calvary, we, we value character uh, because we don't believe you can represent Jesus to the world unless you reflect his character. And so we've kind of said, hey, we want to be like Jesus. And this is how God teaches us the character of Christ because as we endure, he builds that character in our lives. What kind of character is that? It's the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. That's what God is trying to build into your life, into my life. And he does that as we endure. The, these, these characteristics begin to show up in our life. And we go, oh, wow, look at that. I'm learning how to love. I'm learning how to be patient. I'm learning how to be gentle. I'm learning joy. And then he says character, as that develops in our lives, produces hope. Hope. Now this is not hope like I hope something good happens, like I hope I win the lottery or I hope the Cardinals win the Super Bowl. See, those are baseless hopes. We're talking about hope that is certain. And the kind of hope that Paul's talking about is the certainty that God is real and his word is true. God is real and his word is true. So as you endure the sufferings, God builds the character in your life. And as he builds the character in your life, you become certain that God is real. That no, there's not going to be any evidence found, any discovery made that's going to suddenly, you know, destroy your faith in God because you know that he's real and you know that his word is true and it's trustworthy and you can base your life on it and build your life on it. 
You see, that as the Holy Spirit builds that character of Christ in you, that hope becomes certain. And you know what that hope produces? It, it leads us to a life of confidence and joy. You're not going to be put to shame. Confidence and joy. And who of us doesn't want to live a life of confidence and joy? You guys want to be confident and joyful? Good. Five of you do. That's awesome. The, uh, see, the truth is we all do. And if we want that in our lives, then guess what we need to do? We need to rejoice in our sufferings. We need to rejoice in our sufferings if we're going to get to that place. Because suffering is part of this broken, sin-tainted world that we live in. It's going to be part of this world until Jesus comes again and concludes history as we know it. And since it's part of this world, we might as well embrace the process that God has for us and respond in a mature, life-giving manner. So we rejoice because God loves us and is for us. You have peace with God. And we rejoice because heaven is our unchanging destiny. You're standing in grace. And we rejoice because God wants us to grow up through the pain and adversity he is teaching us. It's a lot like um, the decision I made a few years ago to work out. Yeah, I actually work out. I know some of you are looking at this body going, don't see it. I said I worked, I started working out. I didn't say I started eating right. Uh, those are two separate things. So I'm fat and I'm fit. So um, I don't know if that's real, but it's, it's my reality, okay? So, and, and understand, this was a huge decision for me. We were going to five worship services. We're talking about five worship services, and I thought, I'm not man enough for that. I got, I got to work out. And, and I don't just mean join a gym, because I'd been a, contributing to gyms for a long time in my life. <laughs> and I actually went sometimes, but it really didn't do much good, because I just talked to people, walked on the treadmill a little bit, picked up a few weights, moved them around, and almost broke a sweat. And uh, I was like, no, I'm just too lazy to do this. Um, so I went to uh, Dan, who, who's the owner of Titan Gym, and I said, hey, would you train me? And he got this sick, sadistic look on his face, uh, smiling. He's going, yes, show up at 6.30 tomorrow. And I went, 6.30 in the morning? <laughs> Seriously? And see, I've always been morally opposed to working out just for the sake of working out. I just think it's, you know, it's wrong. Disguise it like a game or something. And, and so I went and embraced the suffering, the pain, uh, not because I wanted to, but uh, because I wanted to be able to make it through the weekend. And here's the thing. I, I can rejoice in that pain, in that suffering, uh, because of what it produces. So it used to be I'd preach three, four times and, and just be like, I'm a zombie afterwards. And, and now uh, I'm still tired when I get done, but uh, I can still go. Now I can go play golf. I can go on a date with my wife. I can play with the grandkids. Not just sit on the couch and watch them like I'm too tired to do anything, but actually get down and play with them and hang out with them and run around with them. I rejoice in that, in the results, but uh, I still hate it. It's still pain. And, and just to be honest, uh, you know, God's caused good out of my suffering, but uh, I didn't want to continue. Let me tell you about the first day I went to work out. Okay? I decided to do this. I went to the, the, the gym, and, and I walked in, and the room is filled with, you know, a bunch of ladies. And I thought, oh, great, I have to work out like a girl. <laughs> okay? Just being honest. Pride is in here, and it's like, oh, okay, great. And, and so we start doing the workout, and, uh, and I'm not in shape. And uh, this is hard, but my pride says, you got to keep up because, you know, you got to stay up with the girls. And uh, about two-thirds of the way through the workout, my body said, check, please. Uh, <laughs> Because the room started spinning, you know, and uh, it started feeling sick to my stomach. And so I crawled over to the edge and I hugged the concrete floor because it was cool. And I'm just like laying there going, okay, don't pass out, don't pass out, don't pass out. And uh, at this point, I, it hurts too much to even worry about the pride that's dying right there. Uh, and this is how bad it was. The ladies finished working out and then they came and stepped over my body to get their keys, <laughs> you know, so they could leave. And can I just be honest with you? I, at that point, I do not want to ever go back and work out again. But I did. Now, here's the really embarrassing part. I went back, and they said, okay, you take it easier than the girls. 
you're not man enough to work out like a girl yet, so you just need to go ahead. And, and they did for a while. I had to like take it easy. But here's the thing. I didn't quit. I didn't give up. I wanted to. I wanted to let go. I wanted to stop. But I, I didn't quit. And now I'm proud to say that I can work out like a girl. <laughs> now, not sure I like that applause. But anyway... <laughs> So the truth is, life hurts. There's going to be pain. There's going to be suffering. Uh, are you going to complain and blame and get angry about it? Or are you going to be mature and rejoice in the reality that God is with you and he's for you and he's growing you? Because the choice is yours and God wants us to grow up. And I share that knowing that there's some of you in this room right now uh, that in your own way, you're uh, laying there on the floor, hugging the concrete, wanting to give up. You're wanting to quit on your marriage. You're wanting to quit on your sobriety. You're wanting to quit on life itself. You're wanting to give up on work or on your family or whatever it is that is really difficult and painful right now. Some of you are on the verge of giving up on your faith. And the Apostle Paul is saying to us, do not lose heart in doing good, for in due time you will reap a harvest if you do not give up. Amen. And it's not easy, but it's worth it. If you'll let God lead you and teach you and give you the strength to endure, you will reach that place of character and hope, and hope will not disappoint. Don't give up. Will you pray with me?